good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who's on the line. Um, welcome again to another uh, Deep Learning for Science lecture. We're really excited to have uh, Rami al here uh, to talk about attentional language. Um, Rami al is a senior research scientist at Google Research. Recently, he has been focused on building robust self-supervised cross-lingual language models where zero text pre-processing is required. The token-free techniques he introduced enable maximal sharing of representation across languages. Rami's interests extend to learning efficient representations for deep retrieval and learning from structured data such as graphs. Rami applies his deep learning expertise to assisted writing products at Google such as Smart Reply and Smart Compose. Um, I'm sure you've all used those in, uh, in Gmail or Google products in one form or another. We're really pleased to have uh, Rami here to talk about attention and language. And um, uh, this topic is why it's focused on, uh, on language. The architecture itself deals with structures that we have uh, encountered um, um, in sciences, such as in, for example, in biology and in chemistry. Uh, and Rami will be, um, yeah, commenting on those things. Welcome. Uh, hi. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mustafa. Uh, so, uh, hi everyone. Um, I'm, today I'm going to be talking about um, attention and language. And attention recently had um, a quite uh, popular introduction to the deep learning toolbox of tricks. Uh, it has been quite successful in, in language applications specifically. Uh, huge progress in language understanding happened in the last three years, thanks to attention, um, thanks to the transformer networks. And um, uh, we see quality gains and we see uh, improvement in understanding our models with interpretability through the attention you know, mechanism. So I'm pleased today to uh, come uh, forward to you and present, you know, um, uh, attention as a the the motivation behind introducing an attention and uh, the mechanism itself and the new models we proposed and the late, uh, latest and most recent you know advancement uh, specifically NLP. So um, so as I mentioned the outline we will start with uh, uh, we will cover five areas that are built on top of each other. And I'm hoping that uh, after each section, we take questions. So each section will take between 10 to 15 minutes. So hopefully, you know, the 90 minutes webinar will, will have ample time to cover all of uh, your questions. So first thing, we're going to start by motivating, you know, uh, attention with uh, a common problem in natural language understanding, which is called language modeling. Um, and attention is not limited to language, but I think this is one of the most basic problems in language understanding that uh, will be quite uh, easy to understand and uh, quite clear where the problems uh, lie in. Uh, then we're going to propose the solution, which is called attention. And we will explain the mechanism slowly, uh, step by step. Uh, then we'll see the benefits in terms of quality and interpretability. And hopefully, we will uh, lay the, uh, the technical background necessary to introduce a new family of models called the transformers. And these models has been quite, quite popular since their introduction in 2017, specifically in self-supervised, you know, pre-training regimes. And you most probably heard of uh, T5 and GPT3 GPT and so on. Um, so we will cover some of the applications of the transformers in self-supervision. Then uh, finally and briefly, we will cover like some of the scalability issues with the attention mechanism and how we can address these scalability, computational scalability bottlenecks. So as I mentioned, um, uh, let's start with language modeling. And language modeling basically is just the problem of assigning a probability to a sequence. And uh, what does that mean? Basically, we are interested in predicting the future uh, in language. So given a prefix or context or a history of various words, I would like to predict the next word in the sequence. OK? So to give you, an, uh, uh, you know, in a mathematical term, here is a sequence of, with four words. And I'm interested basically in learning the estimating the, the density of the space, estimating the likelihood of the sequence of four words. And, you know, uh, obvious application of probability theory is to basically factor out this uh, probability to uh, using the chain rule. So I estimate. So I estimate the probability of the first word. Then I try to learn the conditional probability of predicting the second word given the first one and the third one give her the first two, and so on, OK? So what does it really look like? I'm going to give an example. If you try to think about, here is a, a 
a context, a prefix, history in the sequence that start with I. Okay, what could you imagine the follow-up word? So you know, it's really not a trivial task to figure out what could have been the next word. So one option is say I visited. Okay, uh, then you think now given two words, what could have been the third word? Now think if I say I visited, you know now the space uh, search space is narrowed down, so it's either a location or a person. There is some entity we're most probably going to follow. So the language model has to uh, assign a pro proper probability over all possibilities. In this case, maybe I visit Paris. Then it's followed by this. And the search space may be also narrowed. Now, most probably you are talking about like you know time. And you know in this case, the model has to predict, for example, or assign a high probability or significant probability over someone. So that is like how you know uh, it feels what the model has actually to answer for us. Okay, so how do I solve this problem? So uh, up to the 2010s, mo most of the popular approaches to solving you know uh, this problem uh, rely on engrams. Um, and what I mean by that is basically we actually just do counting. You know, we basically count uh, how often we saw the prefix, the history. Okay and how often we saw the history followed by the word uh, we are interested in. So if the word here is Paris, we are interested in uh, how often Paris get followed by the context we observe. Okay, so this is basic, you know, uh, conditional probability calculation. And, you know, it's quite straightforward and uh, easy to understand. However, as any non-parametric model, it's quite data hungry. And, you know, um, to get really good estimate of this probability, you have to have a proper amount of counts. So if you have too s small evidence of how often you saw the, the history or small number of counts, how often you saw the word uh, following the history, your estimation of the probability would have high, high var variance. Okay. And more interestingly, we assigning in this counting function every word in its own dimension. What I mean by that is that if I want to assign the probability of the word green appearing after a specific history or prefix, I need to see the count not green followed by the uh, following the, the context or the prefix independently from red. So every word I have to see ev statistical evidence for it appearing in the corpus. And I cannot really easily generalize that, oh, red and the green are colors. And I'm, if I'm saying I bought a um, a green t-shirt or a, a red t-shirt that, you know, I bought the word red or green might be good replacing each other. That doesn't happen with the counting methods. I really have to collect a huge corpus to get enough counts. What I'm basically saying that in counting methods, all of the words have are elements in a dictionary. And in that dictionary, the representation, each word has a one hot vector representation and it has its own dimension. So if in Oxford dictionary, we have 300,000 words, I am literally building a sparse vector space where every uh, word is basically a vector, a vector in that 300 dimensional uh, space. Uh, interestingly, if you lay out these words as their own dimension, have their own unique dimension, they will be at equidistance from each other. And that's fundamentally limiting the understanding of the language model. You are saying that to crawl and walk are equivalently similar to walk and water. And uh, of course, no human perceive these words as actually uh, similar at the same distance. Therefore, we need a basic fix to the counting method. So one of the first approaches was, let's embed the words. Let's embed these words instead of them having their own dimension. Let's project them to a lower dimensional space. Okay, And so instead of having a dimensional space of 300,000 unique words, why don't we learn like a, dimensional, a lower dimensional space of 50 to 500 words? And we call this word embeddings. So the same problem of predicting the next word boils down to every word has its own embedding matrix. Okay, And once I see a word, I extract that vector, that row that corresponds to that word. And in our case, um, to predict W3, I replace every word with its own vector representation, E0, E1, and E2. The three embeddings, I concatenate them. And I basically feed them to D and N uh, network. And the point of the DNN network is to basically predict, you know, the fourth uh, word. Now that proved to be really quite successful, you know, approach. Okay. Now these dimensions in the first introduction in the first paper were really small vectors, like 50-dimensional vectors. 
Now, one problem with the DNN approach is that you only can process constant size uh, of history. So if you train a, a network on uh, a history of, si of, of three words, you need to train another network on a history of four words or five words or six words. So you need basically for every different history, you need a different network, and that could be expensive. One fix for that is to introduce recurrence. Okay. By recurrence, we mean that we are going to apply the same DNN network again and again. It's going to take the new input, but it's also going to take the previous st st uh, state of the network. So here, I feed the first word, uh, get it processed by the function A. It produces a hidden state. The second time I see the word, I will take two inputs, the new word coming in, but also the state of my own network from coming from the previous state. So this way, I'm conditioning on W0 and W1, OK? And I'm producing the new hidden state. At each hidden state, I basically can use it as an input feature vector for a, a multi-class classification to predict the next word with, through a softmax, OK? So basically, recurrence neural network allows us to process variable length input. And if we combine it with word embeddings, that uh, produce really strong uh, language model, OK? So now you are wondering, OK, so I understand the word being, you know, they have your, their own unique dimension and how I represent them as one hot vector representation. What does it mean to capture the, these words as lower dimensional vectors? So when we train these models with recurrent neural network or DNN, people discover that these vectors actually exist in, you know, interesting, uh, 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 you know, layouts in the in the space. So to give you a sense, of what uh, when people projected these words to three-dimensional spaces, they found, for example, that you know, a masculine word uh, cluster together, and feminine word cluster together. They found that um, the gerund cluster together and the past tense cluster together. Here you can even see that you know there is the alignment in the space, the countries on one side and the capitals on the other side. And interestingly, some of the models produce these offsets between the cluster to be almost a linear shift. So it's a linear translation in, in the vector space. So that was quite interesting and amusing to many people. But that just tells you the intuition that by projecting the words to a lower dimension space, we are able to actually capture like a semantic manifold where distances between words reflect their relatedness, semantic similarity, and syntax similarity. Cool. So question now is like, why are we interested in language modeling? OK, seems like you know, a, a quite obvious problem, but what, what, how can I benefit from it? Well, I'm going to argue now that if you actually have a strong language model, pretty much all of NLP and natural language understanding problems are solved because they boil down to a sequence as an input and a sequence as an output. Okay? One common example of this problem is this translation. So what I'm showing you here is basically uh, a phrase in English, European economic area, and the translation in French. And the goal is if I feed you the source input, sourced, uh, I would like to produce the target uh, language sequence. Okay? So how we are going to do it? Well, we can model it as a language modeling. So let's go there, and let's use an RNN. What I'm doing here, I'm feeding the first uh, beginning of sentence simple, and I'm saying, please predict European. Given European, predict economic. Given economic, predict area. And now, uh, given area, predict end of sen uh, sentence. And now you finished ingesting and consuming all the source uh, sequence, I would like you to predict basically the target sequence, okay? which is the French one, which is the, the goal of the, of the network. So you could lay out the input uh, sentence followed by the output sentence in a one sequence such that a language model is responsible for producing, you know, given the first half to produce the second half. And now we have a translation machine learning model. Now, we can improve upon this in several variations. First, because we're only interested in the targets in, uh, in predicting the targets tokens or words, uh, we might drop the penalty on the on the RNN consuming the source input. So I might say I don't care about necessarily modeling English. I'm only interested in uh, conditioning on the English encoding and only basically producing the French words. So you could drop the losses here. Then you could add capacity to the model by unshared ways. So you actually have a different RNN for the, this part. 
for the target, the part responsible for generating the target uh, sentence than the part responsible for uh, consuming the source um, sentence. Now, we fundamentally call these two parts, the first one that consume the input called encoder, and the one that responsible for generating the output, we call it a decoder. So now, by starting with a language model, modifying it with a couple of uh, tricks, we basically ended up implementing seek to seek which is a quite a popular approach for most of structured prediction problems in NLP. So you could think of seek to seek as just a language model that I, you know, a special case of a language model where I drop the losses on the, uh, on the, on the input side, I unshared the weights, and therefore I'm only interested in doing the generation and not modeling necessarily the, the probability distribution of the input. Cool. So this seems like solving all problems, uh, except there are people notice an interesting uh, feature. So what they noticed is that when I feed the input sequence in the encoder, if I to the and try to generate the output in the decoder, I get better result if I reve uh, reverse the sequence. Okay, so that's a little bit interesting. The original order was not the most beneficial for the RNN, huh? So that seems like quite uh, uh, contradicting. You would assume that reading English from left to right is better for translating to French. Why would I read English from right to left? Okay. So what we noticed is that there seems to be, when we inspect the RN representation at the end of the encoder state, okay, we notice it to be only remembering the most recent enigrams. Okay. So it really does not remember really far away in history. And given translation to a large degree is a linear, I mean, definitely it's not linear alignment, but you would assume that the first words appear in the French uh, sentence will correspond to the first words in the English one, that if I forget what the, what the first words in the English input sentence, I already, you know, might not be able to generate the, in French, the right French words. So that basically uh, pushed people to propose a hackish solution, which saying, you know what, Instead of processing the sequence in one order, left to right, or right to left, why don't we combine them? Why don't we process it left to right and right to left? Okay. So now I'm conditioning the decoder part on the first words of the English sentence and the last words of the English sentence. Now you could see that this is still limiting. What what if the order of the you know of some grammar some language has a grammar where the important words are in the middle of the sentence? Okay. To start the translation process. Well. Fundamentally, what we are referencing here is a representation bottleneck problem, okay? So basically what we are referring to is that if the source sentence length increases, we see that the translation quality is decreasing. What that means is that the uh, recurrent neural network is trying to inject and compress all information in a fixed vector representation is really not sufficient and not practical. The longer the sequence, the more we have to drop information. And when we handle the representation of the RNN to the decoder, the decoder can, doesn't have enough bandwidth to actually get a good generation. So solving it by doubling the size of the encoder state by doing bidirectional uh, 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 RNN was useful, but is not, is not solving it fundamentally. Definitely, the decoder does not have enough input from the encoder to decide exactly, uh, you know, uh, which elements in the encoder are useful. Okay. So, so far, this is the problem. This is the setup. We have the sequential modeling being bottlenecked by a fixed size representation from the input side, and we want to fix this problem for generation. Um, is there any questions so far? Uh, before I move to the next section where we're going to discuss like the, the mechanism of solving, you know, um, the bottleneck in the encoding stage. Uh, I, I don't see currently, I don't see any questions. Please, if you yeah. have any questions, you write them in the Q&A and we'll handle them in the next uh, time Rami stops. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so now we will move to the next section where we showed in the first section that language modeling could be hindered by the bottleneck, you know, uh, of the fixed size representation coming from the RNN, and we want to modify it by, you know, introducing a mechanism called attention. So here is our setup again, and we have the encoder at the top and the decoder at the bottom, and we are um, consuming, you know, different inputs, and I have bidirectional RNN, 
and each st time step, uh, I'm going to produce a state. And just to clarify, I will use the word token, word, and time step uh, interchangeably. Um, again, we are discussing in general sequential problems that might be language or not. Um, so I have the encoder here, all states. And so far, my solutions in the previous section were um, look at the last state or at the first state. But fundamentally, we should not be actually you know, limited uh, to um, uh, one of these states. Now, the decoder definitely can only read one vector. So we need to summarize. We need one vector at a time. But instead of looking at one, why don't we learn a weighted sum of them? Okay. What I mean by that, you could imagine a situation where I would like to read the when I'm decoding, when I'm generating the first token in the decoder, I would like to uh, to read the encoder state of the first time step and the third time step. Okay. However, when I move to the next decoding stage, I might be interested in reading the first and the second encoder states. Okay. And so on. In the third time step when I'm generating, I might be interested in the first and the third again. Okay. Every time I'm looking at two states, for example, and I'm learning a weighted sum, I'm compressing them to one vector, then feeding them to the RN. However, the vector, the compressed representation is not anymore only function of the encoder. It's a function of the decoder state. Okay. Now you are wondering, how did I choose these encoder states and how do I decide which ones to pick? Well, we are going to ask basically the decoder. What we are going to do, we are going to, at any decoding step, here is D2, okay? I'm going to learn different weights between the state of D2 and the different states of the encoder, okay? State 0, 2, 3. Each weight will be basically really a simple um, a dot product. So I will take decoder number 2, for example, state, dot product with the state. I will learn a weight. I will exponentiate it and normalize it. Okay, so A3 here basically is saying I will take D2, the state of the decoder at step two, and basically dot product with S3, okay, then exponentiate the result and normalize it. And what I'm learning here is a probability distribution over the encoder states given the decoder state. What basically what we are asking, the decoder is deciding which parts of the input in the encoder are actually important for the, this, the current decision, okay? And you could see here, it decided that, you know, the most important state is A0, followed by A1, then A3, then the last important state is A2. I learn a weighted sum of these states, and that is basically the input to the decoder, okay? So basically, what we are saying, there is no unique representation of the encoder anymore. The encoder cannot represent the whole input in one fixed vector, Instead, we are going to ask the decoder, the gener text generator, which states of the input encoder are important at each time step, learn a weighting sum, and feed it to the decoder, and go on. Okay? So basically, that is the most important piece of the whole talk. It's like that we cannot compress the input efficiently or universally. What we better can do is keep all of the representations of the input at all time steps, and for whatever applications we care about, let the application decide which parts of the inputs are relevant through the attention mechanism. And the attention mechanism, as I ex is explained, the decoder state will decide using a similarity function which parts of the encoder are relevant. It will compress the encoder states according to that weighted sum we learned through the attention mechanism. Cool. Now, let's apply this mechanism to translation and see what happens. Okay, so here is my output, and here is the input. And you could see the first word in the output, L, was attending really aggressively to the first output uh, of the encoder, the. Accord was attending aggressively to agreement. Sor to on, la to the. Oh, zone. Zone did not attend to European. On the opposite, said, oh, I would rather attend to area. Okay, so you could see that the alignment not anymore linear. Moreover, some of the word attended to two words at a time, not necessarily one. So you could see that not only we improve the translation quality, 
we also land an interpretable model that tells us what is exactly the model is focusing on at each time of the step. Okay, so we are improving the quality and improving the interpretability. Moreover, not only we are learning uh, word to word translation, that European here is equivalent to European here, but also we are learning alignment. So without even giving the model the alignment model, we are learning word by word translation and alignment of sequences jointly, which is something really was revolutionary at the time, because many machine translation system at the time was have to have a component of alignment first, then a component of word to word translation. Okay? So that was quite, uh, quite interesting. So this is not only limited to text-to-text uh, -text application. It's not necessarily NLP. Let's look at another example. And basically here, what I'm asked to do is caption generation. Given an image, I would like to produce a, a caption. And the caption will be produced by a decoder. And the encoder will try to compress the state of the image. Okay. Before attention, it was you have to produce the whole image in one vector. Here, we have a lot of liberty on what to focus on. So if I have a woman is a throwing app and I want to generate the next word, when we look at the attention mechanism, we notice that the decoder is assigning high weights in the encoder states that correspond to the, to the image of Frisbee. If we go further, we can see the same paradigm is happening. I have just the word app and the decoder trying to generate the next word is literally highlighting the region of the image that correspond to, uh, to the dog. Another application is speech synthesis. Okay, So you could see here, I have the output here as being text and the input being audio spectrograms. And uh, the first word in the output does not attend to any of the silent moments. So the model understands there is no information here. Um, and jump into the first useful you know, um, time, time step in the audio. And you could see, you know, it's pretty much almost linear. There is no much reversing. Um, uh, some, some of the steps actually, you know, uh, different, like some, some of the steps in the generated decoder look at the same input. So some one single time step might correspond to different uh, several characters in the output space. So you could see we can learn one-to-many assignment, many-to-one assignment, many-to-many -many assignments easily with this, you know, uh, attention mechanism. Uh, here is another one called reading comprehension, where we have a paragraph. Uh, we need to comprehend the paragraph and try to answer a prompt, where we delete part of the prompt and try to fill in the blank. And you could see that the decoder trying to fill in the blank is showing us where it actually thinks you know, the answer is. In some cases, it's quite confident. In some places, we're like, it might be entity 23 or 114 or 187. Uh, but that's quite interesting. That might lead us, you know, to learn some of the error analysis that is useful to improve the models. So, so far, I have been describing uh, uh, an attention mechanism, but it is not the only attention mechanism. And in this taxonomic tree, I'm trying to give you a bigger picture that what I am describing so far is actually only this part of attention, OK? What I mean by that is that because the weight between the encoder state and the decoder state is decided by uh, the content of these states, by the vector representation of these states, we call it associative. There are other techniques where you attend to the encoder state not by the state of the encoder, but rather by the order of the state. So you will distinguish this is the uh, state, uh, hidden state one, two, and the three. You don't look at the state, you only look at its position. Some uh, models that popularize location based is pointer networks and neural Turing machine. Everything we are doing here is we always doing weighted sum of the encoder states. We are not picking, a, uh, uh, making hard, uh, hard assignment. We are, we are always doing a soft weighted, uh, weighted sum of all the encoder state. Therefore, we call this soft attention. If you want an application where you don't want to do weighted sum over all of the state, but really pick the top k states, you might end up, this might not be differentiable. And to make it work, you need a re a reinforcement learning techniques. And that we will call like, you know, uh, hard, ha hard attention. Okay, all of this exists in the subtree of explicit attention. What I mean by that, that we change the architecture, we change the modeling to model explicitly the attention. 
Uh, what does implicit attention correspond to is a normal DNN. Basically, any neural network for, with feedforward layers, you could ask the question, which part of the input which are sensitive to the output, or which part of the output are sensitive to the input, by just you know, computing the Jacobian. So the Jacobian is basically the original attention. It literally gives you the sensitivity map between the inputs and the outputs, and therefore you could figure out which part of the inputs will lead to the change in the output uh, direction. So everything we are focused on in the rest of the talk is basically what we will call it explicit soft associative attention, okay? which is the most popular type of attention. So um, questions so far. We, so far, we have been describing the problem. We propose a solution. And I want to introduce in the next section basically um, a new family of models that push attentions everywhere in the architecture and utilize attention fully uh, in all of the layers of the network. But before we move on, uh, let me know if you have questions. Um, yeah, we have a few questions. Um, oh, cool. So one of them was very early on uh, when you were talking about RNNs and it's saying like, what about variable sequence link, uh, sequence links? Y yes, w w what about it, sorry? Uh, I think it's just, it's asking whether um, uh, these models can handle variable sequence, sequence link. The RNNs, yes. If, if we are talking about attention, uh, absolutely. But uh, just historically, RNN existed before transformer and attention models. So at that time when we started looking at language modeling, we had the counting methods. We moved to DNN. That did not um, cover uh, variable sequence uh, links. By the introduction of RNN, we fixed that problem. And from there on, all of our models should be, in principle, able to uh, model variability in length. Uh, another question is: uh, Is this forgetting of the forgetting of the beginning of the sequence uh, when it's longer than two hundred a universal property of any RNN, uh, e.g., LSTM, or was it uh, was it observed also for time series analysis or only for language? Uh, so I can speak that th this is quite clearly a problem w within language uh, in the sense, regardless of what is the cell of the RNN, is it LSTM or uh, GRU or just a, a vanilla RN. We, we, this is, has been observed by several groups that basically the, the vector, you know, the larger, the larger the hidden state of the RNN, of course, you're going to carry more information. But at best, you can remember the, the order of the last 50 words, and you might remember a bag of word representation, an unordered representation of the last 200 words, but you cannot really learn more than that. You lose a lot. Um, because the compression is too aggressive. So uh, for time series applications, uh, I, I didn't study this area, but I'm not going to be surprised that it's fundamentally hard to compress memory. And therefore, like, you know, um, attention is just uh, avoiding compression by saying, you know, there is no unique state of the input. There, let, let the downstream application, in this case, the generator, the decoder, decide which part of the memory is relevant. Um, but fundamentally, compressing the memory uh, has its own value in terms of computational uh, complexity, but it, it's going to be a harder problem. I don't think we solved it. So uh, I think most of our RNNs will suffer regardless of the application, the domain. Another question is, how does attention take into account the order of the encoder tokens? I'm going to cover that in the next section. So let, let's save the time for answering this one in, in the coming section. Okay. I think another one that will be answered later is how much computational overhead do attention mechanisms add? Yes, yes, we will cover those. Uh, just a quickly for, for the order, remember in the when we were studying the RNN attention, the RNN already have an implicit ordering information because it processes every input after the, uh, in sequ it processes the sequence in order. So the RNN doesn't really have much of a problem figuring out like where are you in the sequence. Uh, however, in the transformer, this is going to be a little bit trickier business, and we will introduce different solutions. But for RNNs, uh, RNNs basically, the, 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 it's a sequential model that process input word by word. So it already implicitly have a sense of time. So we don't have to worry about that. Transformers is a different business, and I'm going to propose solutions to that. Uh, we have many more questions. I'll just take yeah. one more, and then the others, we can take them later. Um, it's, yeah. The question says, it seems like a sequ sequence alignment becomes very important here. Are there any pre-processing steps needed because of this? 
or for the no, no. Uh, before attention solution we you used to need to do alignment um attention basically learn the alignment so you don't have to do any pre-processing. The, the attention is going to look through all the input and decide which parts of the input are useful at this current time step in the decoding. So uh, old solution of machine translation problem used to be really a pipeline of things that where you do the alignment alone. Uh, in these models, you, the alignment is already learned jointly. So no need to do any pre-processing. OK, cool. I think we can take uh, some other questions in later time. Cool. Okay, so so now we saw attention, you know, working uh, very well for you know seek-to-seek uh, -seek models and improving the quality of translation by learning alignment jointly and giving us interpretable models. We will move to a next uh, generation of models that just take the idea further. Okay, so to just motivate it, I'm going to give you a, a sentence here where it says Obama is a, a U.S. citizen who is a Democrat, and you know. If I ask you the question, which Obama we are talking about, Michelle or Barack, I think we all agree going to be, you know, we might have a prior favoring one entity versus the other, but fundamentally the sentence is ambiguous. That doesn't actually tell us which, which one of them is the one we mean. Okay. So if I follow it saying his children are Malia and Sasha, you can say like, aha, uh -huh, that's quite clear. Now I know why. Because basically Obama and his co refer we have a mention of Obama in the pronoun his. And because of gender agreement, most probably you mean Barack Obama. And I'm going to highlight to you that as a human looking at these two and linking them together, you are disambiguating his and disambiguating Obama by exchanging information between two time steps in a sequence. OK? So not only. Uh, information has to be exchanged between input and output, as we saw in attention. It's also beneficial to exchange information between the same items and the same input. Okay, so attention does not have to happen from the output to the input. It could also be necessary and useful to do it within the input sequence. Okay, and there where we are going. Basically, I'm saying, if I embed every word into its own state, okay. I am really interested in learning the structure between the states, regardless if I'm doing translation or not. Like, there, the st there is hidden structure in the sequence. There is necessary, it's necessary to exchange information. And therefore, I might like to actually do attention from one every state to every other state. Okay? And while RNN can do that only in one direction, there is no reason for us to be uh, only using one direction. We can do, you know, uh, all possible ways in all directions, okay? So before I start showing you how a transformer works, I just want to introduce uh, two different type of networks uh, that will help us understand, you know, uh, you know, the transformer algorithm. So as I mentioned, I'm going to take every word here. I'm going to embed it to context-free representation. I will call that embedding, you know, a state, you know, just for simplicity. Uh, but basically, every word going to be replaced with, a, with, a, with an embedding, which is a, a, a vector of, you know, 500 dimensions of floating numbers, okay? And for each state, I'm going to pass it through three linear projections, okay? Now, they are called V for value, and K for K, key, and Q for um, query, okay? So basically, this is just a linear matrix that takes every state and projects it to its own vector, okay? The next component of the transformer network is introducing a nonlinearity, where basically I'm taking a vector and passing it through two uh, DNN layers. Uh, if the input is H, I will project it to 4H uh, hidden size. Then from 4H, I will project it down to 1H. Okay? And that will be basically the main nonlinearity component of the transformer network. Cool. So let's move on to the main algorithm. And I'm going to animate to you basically a sequence of five states and show you how a specific state, SA3, will basically do self-attention to the other four states, step by step. Cool. So the first step is we are going to generate um, the vectors, the keys. So every one of these states will pass it through the linear projection called, you know, uh, network K, K. And the network K will produce a vector for each state. Okay. Then I'm going to, because I'm just interested at this moment for S3, I'm going to produce the query 
three. I will do the same thing for every other state, but for simplicity, we're going to take uh, one state uh, for explanation. So query three, basically, I will dot product it with every key in my states. Okay, and trying to measure how much information I can borrow from each state to S3. Okay, so Q3 by K2, Q3 by K3, how much I should self attend to myself, Q3 by K4, and Q3 by K5. Okay, at this stage, I'm learning how strong of information exchange I need to do between S3 and every element in the sequence. Okay. Now, this dot product will produce scalars, okay? And scalars could be positive and negative, and what we are interested in is basically learning a probability distribution. Therefore, I'm going to exponentiate every dot product, okay? Sum them to learn a normalization factor. And for a specific weight, it's going to be the exponentiated dot product over the normalization factor, okay? What that's going to end up looking is just a probability distribution where all of them sum to one. And the next step, I'm going to generate the value vector for each state, okay? And I'm going to claim that the next, the, inf the total information S3 should have in the next uh, iteration should be a weighted sum of the value vectors according to the probability distribution I learned. So I use the queries and the keys to learn a probability distribution over how much information I should borrow from each other state including myself. I use the value vectors, you know, with the weighted sum of the probability distribution to learn the next value, which is V3 W prime. Now, if I keep repeating this process again and again and again, everything I have been describing so far is a linear operation. Therefore, I'm not going to learn more information. It's going to get into equilibrium like page rank. Therefore, I need a nonlinearity element, okay? So I produce the next state for all of these. I need to pass them through a nonlinear network, okay? As I mentioned, it's a 2DNN, okay? H to 4H to H again, okay? And by passing these uh, new V double prime, you know, uh, vectors to the nonlinear network, I will produce the next state of the sequence, okay? And as you can see, that is basically, you know, the main self-attention uh, um, mechanism. At each stage, I'm gonna produce three vectors, Two vectors of them will decide how each element should attend to the other element. The third vector will be used as the message passing uh, uh, packet load and or payload. And using once I accumulate all of the information from all state at each time step, I will pass them through nonlinearity to produce the next um, hidden state of the sequence. Okay. So again. I start with a sequence. I apply the transformer algorithm the first time. I end up with the next sequence. I process it again, get third sequence, fourth, and this is the final one. So basically, I'm going to apply this again and again and again. And it's going to stack on top of each other without being reduced to one operation because we have nonlinear networks being applied on each state. OK? Um, these parameters between these transformer layers do not have to be shared. They could be shared. Uh, but they don't have to be. Cool. So, so far I have describing producing one key, one query, and one value vector for each state. And we saw that will help us to exchange information of gender agreement between two worlds, his and Obama. If I use that network of key, key query and value to exchange Obama and his, it's not going to work because what I am trying to exchange here is number agreement is referred to singular, are referred to plural. If I use is, I'm trying to single uh, highlight that Obama is singular. So using the same query key and value might not be sufficient to model all kinds of relations between words. Okay? Therefore, I might need to introduce a heterogeneous graph, a heterogeneous relation. So the simple solution to that is called multi-head attention. What I mean by that, instead of producing one value network, one uh, key network, one query network, I will produce n number of them, okay? So basically, for every state, I will project it n number of times to values, n number of times to keys, and number n number of times to queries. And that will allow me to establish different type of relation between words. So that is the first extension. Um, second extension, as one of the questions mentioned earlier, 
Um, specifically, the transformer self-attention, if we are not starting with RNN, it does not have a sense of order. Like I'm encoding all of these um, independently from each other, okay? Um, uh, independent of order. So what I'm actually learning is a set encoder and less of a sequence encoder. To fix that, one of the first proposed solution called positional embeddings. What that means is instead of modifying the architecture to make it sequential like RNN, I can just tag each time step with a variable, and these variables are linked. What I mean by that, here is my initial states. I'm going to modify my states by adding a vector that I will learn that correspond to the position, not to the state. So this position will be the same for all states that appear in the second position in any sequence. Okay. Now, if what does that mean? What do we learn? Here I'm projecting in, we're using PCA into two dimension the, the, pro, the positional embeddings we learned from a transformer network. And the color here represents how they are ordered. So the lighter one are earlier in the sequence, and the darker the color, the further you are in the sequence. And you can see that this is a cluster to large degree by color. What that means is that positions early in the sequence have similar representation, and position later in the sequence have similar representation. Now, because that we are going to add them to the states, and the states will be going through linear projected that's going to be using dot product, what happens if we dot product these projection uh, vectors directly? It will tell us some, something about the prior we are trying to inject into the network. And you can see from a real uh, network that was 100 million parameter trained on language, you could see that the position embeddings we are learning, they are kind of saying, you know what, for every position, I would like to look at small lo local neighborhood in the future and a small local neighborhood in the past. And most of the really far away uh, positions, I don't want to attend to. However, there are strides of global exchanges of information. And that is quite you know, necessary for language because while language you know, definitely depends largely on uh, short-term dependencies, still it has a fat tail of long-term dependency. And ignoring these fat long tail dependencies will harm the performance. So you could see the large degree with the prior we are injecting into the network is that attend locally, focus on, on uh, close by states, close by words, but once often, you know, pay attention to really far away tokens uh, that might be able to summarize basically um, uh, the state of the network. So you could see the network learned that you know, um, th these positions could be global exchanges of information. Um, the problem with this approach that if I trained my network on 128 positions and I see sequences 500, it, I need position vectors from 128 to 500, but I never trained for these. I never fine-tuned them. I never learned them. So it's hard to generalize to longer sequences. To fix that problem, people propose a solution by instead of learning the vector, why don't we design it. And a good way to design it is to try to uh, assign every dimension uh, uh, a frequency information. So what I mean by that, the vector, here is the time steps, and here is a sinusoidal uh, curve. And at dimension 16, uh, let's imagine the position number 400, we are going to take the value of the sinusoidal curve at uh, time step 400 and put it in dimension 16. In dimension 32, we are going to lower the frequency of the sinusoidal and basically pull the value uh, from them from the sinusoidal at time step 400. So to construct the position signal vector for 400, I can keep taking the value of the sinusoidal at different frequencies. Here is a frequency of 64, uh, dimension 64, and here is the frequency I'm going to assign uh, for dimension 128. And you could see the lower the frequency, the more I'm learning about global positioning uh, of the item in the sequence. And the higher the frequency, I'm more learning about this, the local positioning of the, of the item. If I stack these on top of each other, okay, I'm going to basically learn the same kind of prior. Is that to large degree, please attend to the local neighborhood, okay, and try to ignore the, um, the far away dependencies. And now I want to mention all of this only necessary for the first application of the transformer layer. Like you only inject this prior at the input, and it's not necessarily to inject it in further layer uh, layers. Actually, after the first two layers, the information in the in the sequence not anymore local, and you know 
forcing it to be local will harm the performance. So we only need to inject order in the first layer just to give the network a sense what is the, you know, uh, um, what is the first local attention it has to do. Another idea, and instead of modeling position as one per time step, you can model basically the distance. So here, if when S3 try to attend to S1, I can multiply the query with a matrix. The matrix will be indexed by the distance. So here will be minus two when S3 looking at S1. But when S3 looking at S5, it will be W2. What that means like, I will have a matrix for one step in the future, another matrix for two st steps in the future, one matrix for one step in the past, another matrix for two steps in the past, and so on. And that will allow me basically to generalize to longer sequences you know, during training. We call this idea relative position embedding. Okay? Another idea is that you don't have necessarily to change the input, you can change the architecture by limiting the attention uh, to only local attention in the first two layers of the network. We observed if you keep the attention to two tokens to the left and two tokens to the right in the first network and then next network four to the left, four to the right, you really don't need to inject any positional information. The network will quickly figure out kind of the order. Okay, so now let's revisit our uh, problem, translation. Now we get in, we introduce our uh, self-attention network, which called the tra transformer. Just to summarize, we take the input, we inject input embed, uh, positional embedding, we pass it through multi-head uh, self-attention, we pass it through feed forward, and that is the encoder state. We feed the encoder state to the decoder, which is going to do cross-attention, as I, we saw in the uh, first, uh, second section, and we are going to pass it through several feed forward networks. Okay. Then we're going to make our predictions. Okay. And the animation to the left will explain that. So I'm going to wait for it to come back. So here is our input, the four words. We are going to do self-attention within these four words. They will exchange information within each other. Okay. I'm going to apply the self-attention several layers. Okay. And here I'm, I'm finishing it. I'm getting the final encoding states. Now I'm starting the decoding. Okay. And I'm conditioning on the encoder input. Now, the next time step is conditioning on the encoder and what I generated so far. So there is a cross-attention and self-attention at the same time. And I'm now generating, uh, you may, might not be seeing the words, yes. Yeah, now I'm generating, you know, the French words, if that makes sense. So here I'm seeing self-attention within the sequence of the encoder, self-attention within the sequence of the decoder, and a cross-attention from the decoder to the encoder. Okay. And that produced basically state-of-the-art results, you know, for translation. If I try to visualize uh, what a transformer network will do if it's trained in supervised fashion on sentiment analysis, as you would imagine, look at the attention, you know, mask, the most important connection. Good is really attending significantly to very, because very good is different than good, but also attending to the negation. So good and very both attending to not because it negates the meaning. So you could see how we can use these, you know, weights on the graph on the attention mask to tell us about what the network is learning. Okay. So um, in comparison, if you compare attention to convolution, what convolution is doing is saying that the next state three depend on five only by the distance between them. So the weight of a convolution kernel only decided by the offset between the state I want to generate and the state I'm reading. However, in attention, the weight between the next state three is dependent on the content of the previous state three and the content of the previous of five, but not necessarily only on the distance between three and five. So that is the main difference. You could think of attention as a marginal uh, form of convolution where the attention weights are a function of both the states and not only of the distance between both the states. Now we can inject into the state positional information to model some kind of local, you know. Uh, local information uh, prior. In comparison to graph and neural network, in graph and neural networks, we are taking the structure given to us, and we only exchange information over edges with message passing over the edges given to us. However, in attention, we have to learn the structure. The structure is not given. No one tells us what is the graph that represents the sentence. So we assume a complete graph that's expensive to compute, and we exchange information over this complete graph, um, but we kind of prune it uh, jointly while we are learning. 
So we eliminate some of the edges, you know, depending on what the network find to be useful to connect two nodes or not. So you could think about the attention is quite the same graph in your network, uh, but it learned the structure of the structure is not given. Also, the attention is implemented in a way that is extremely efficient for accelerated hardware. All of the message passing uh, is happening on a density graph through a matrix multiplication. Pruning the graph of attention might not lead to speed up even if we, we are processing less edges because um, sparse matrix multiplication might, might, might not be faster on GPU or TPU. So think about a graph in your network is more general case. However, attention can handle cases where there is no structure and attention has extremely efficient implementation on accelerated hardware. So, so far, um, we explained the tension, we went to transformers, and I'm going to now move to self-supervision. Any questions so far? There are many questions, but since we're also running out, kind of oh. running out of time, so maybe um, let you get through the rest and then come back to questions. Cool. Okay. So, uh, now we introduce transformers. One of the most uh, um, popular applications of transformer is self-supervision, and to explain what that means. Uh, I think most of you are familiar with learning being supervised and supervised. So what I want to say is self-supervision is applying the supervised techniques of a classification and maximizing likelihood in the domain where we have no labels. Okay. So I see self-supervision is kind of really close to unsupervised, but it's not necessarily about dimensionality reduction or clustering. It's more like I'm learning a classifier, but I'm generating my own labels automatically. How I'm going to generate the labels automatically? I will start with an input. I will inject noise into it. Then I will ask my model to basically to reconstruct the input from the noisy variation of it, OK? And using classification, for example. Explain this more. You could think about the language model I explained in the beginning, OK, as causal language model, is actually a norm of noise. Basically, I'm hiding the future from you, and I'm telling you, reconstruct the future given the, the past, OK? We can implement that using a transformer using uh, by controlling the attention masks. So there is no node can attend to the future. This node cannot, y1 cannot attend to y, uh, y2. All of its connection should look at the past. The way we control that using, you know, um, you know a, a mask over the attention, basically by, if you think about it as a graph, we are pruning the edges that could look at the future and only leaving the edges that will look at the past, okay? Now, I trained a language model, uh, a transformer uh, on top of, a, um, I trained a transformer using language modeling as a task, and I looked at the self-attention uh, weights, and as you can see, um, the network gives, um, you know, um, the information exchange between words in, in the network makes a lot of sense, semantically and syntactically. And the question like, okay, so you trained the language model, uh, for self-supervision, what are we going to do with that? How we can utilize that? Well, uh, OpenAI popularized the method, um, uh, we'll call it like the prompt method or the probing method, where basically what they did is they trained a, a transformer network on language, causal language model, just to generate the next token. And they said, uh, give, after the model was trained, a task description in natural language and give it a prompt. And basically ask the network to answer. Translate English to French. Here is an English word. Give me the answer. Because they never gave an example, we call this zero shot. If you give me one example of the task, okay, we call this one shot, okay? If I give you several examples of the same task, plus the task description and then prompt, we call this few shot, okay? Will that work? Um, surprisingly, uh, yes. So, um, you could see the more examples I give you, the better the performance on a wide range of tasks. But more importantly, the larger the model, okay, the better the performance. So just by training a 200 billion parameters network of a transformer using causal language model on the web, it's basically able to learn so many tasks by giving it around 10 examples. So the amount of, uh, adaptation I need is so small. So to learn translation, if I give you 10 pairs of English sentences to French sentences, though the model never saw uh, translation pairs during training, the model is able to infer the task and, and do very well at it. 
Now, th this, this paradigm of probing has its own problem because you assume that the network figure out how to infer the task from the description and the examples. And of course, the network will assign a probability over all, uh, over all possible tasks and will be uncertain about which task it has to conduct. So, you know, it comes with its own problems where, you know, you have general model that you can adapt differently according how you modify, how you modify the input. And it might be, you know, it might not be clear what is the best way to describe a task or what is the best set of examples to lead to the best accuracy. Uh, however, this get, get a lot of attention and popularity because it enables the user creativity. In the sense, it's really fun to design, you know, tasks with two to three to five to six to 10 examples and see what the model does. So it really need minimal intervention from the user. And I included in the slides a demo. Uh, I will leave it later for you to look at the video of how GPT-3, for example, does use language, causal language modeling to do adaptation to different tasks. Another popular family of tasks called mask language modeling, and that was popularized by uh, BERT. So what we do here is we have an input, original text. We try to hide different spans of the text, feed to the encoder, the, the modified text with these masked spans and ask the decoder basically to generate the spans back, okay? So the difference with the causal language modeling that in causal language modeling, the spans that are hidden always in the future, all, always at the end of the sequence. Here, we are generalizing it. We are saying it could, have, it could appear anywhere in the sequence and you are responsible for generating the missing spans every, anywhere in the sequence. Uh, that will force the encoder to utilize the past, the previous tokens to X, and the future tokens to X to make the decision of generating X. So you're kind of learning bi-directional information instead of only unidirectional one. Okay. Now, how do we tell, once we train these models on a huge amount of text like the web, how we should use them to do different kind of tasks? This is for a different paradigm. The paradigm is I feed it the first example. The model is trying to, given this input, try to generate this output, will make a mistake. I will send a gradient update to the pre-trained model and fine tune it. So the model has been trained already, but I'm going to train it further only on this example that belongs to a specific task. And this is a process of iterating a specific task example and updating and changing the parameters model further. We call it fine tuning. Okay. Now, the advantage of it, once you are done, this model can do this task and you don't have to tell it about the task again. It already know what it's supposed to do, okay? So it's not generalized in a form, but it's also efficient computationally because I don't have to process the task description and the examples again and again as we were doing with the GPT-3 paradigm, okay? So one, one uh, great idea came from T5. They pre-trained uh, mask language modeling on, on the web. And for finite tuning, to simplify the process of finite tuning, they said all of finite tuning tasks will include, um, will be the input is text and the output is text. And that will simplify doing multitasking. So basically, that makes a lot of sense if you're doing text generation. If you're doing classification, might be because you can assign every class label a word. But interestingly, it works really nicely, even with regression. They literally converted all numbers to strings and said, like, okay, you need to predict the digits. And that worked fine. So mask language modeling with a universal API that takes text and produce text is kind of the state of art of pre-trained model and language uh, understanding. And one of the most famous uh, model is T5, where it includes it's a, it includes encoder and a decoder. In the encoder, if you have multitask setup, you, you tell it a token about what task you are interested in. You serialize the input as text, and you ask, you give it the output you need to do as also text, and you fine tune the model. And you can fine tune the model on several tasks at the same time. Okay. So so far, I have been describing, you know, end-to-end -end learning, uh, where you know the model we specify data sets uh, in general form, and we ask the transformer to solve the problem. And fundamentally, that didn't used to be the case in NLP. Uh, classical NLP pipeline include really several steps of tokenization, normalization, part of speech tagging, parsing, entities, semantic role labeling, uh, co-reference relations, and any error happens at any stage will propagate down the pipeline, introducing more errors. The current today's um, pipeline 
or NLP system is quite simplified to compare to what we used to have. So we replaced all of these components with a deep, deep neural network, okay? That is basically a transformer with self-attention. Uh, unfortunately, um, we still have tokenization normalization, and we'll jump to that. Now, some people get a little bit depressed and it's like, okay, if a neural network can solve everything, um, what is left? Well, it's not necessarily that solving these tasks was helping anyone. So I would say this is, think about this like the smartphone analogy. And on top of that, you want to build the apps. So you might be not interested in pre-training new uh, uh, big models, but you might be interested in repurposing them to different tasks. So because this element is still there and is still in practice uh, with a lot of engineering and modeling time and computation and produce uh, errors of equality, uh, I focused on this piece of eliminating tokenization and normalization and just include it in the deep learning stack. So we only end up with one transformer network that takes text as it is and produce text. So to, the way to do it, the first question is segmentation context-free. Do we really need to tell the model where the boundary of words are? Uh, also, if we assign the word boundaries, are our segmentation optimal or it's task dependent? You could imagine some task would like to uh, you know, uh, separate Yahoo exclamation mark into two tokens, and another task would like to have it as one token. So to solve this problem and, you know, land a segmentation that, you know, uh, could be fine-tuned for the downstream task, we propose encoding text into sequence of bytes using UTF-8. This makes the embedding matrix extremely small. It's only 256 symbols. And allow us to handle, you know, scripts and in new characters. We discovered by doing that, not only we achieve better results on character language modeling, but also we match word performance. So basically the transformer are able to learn on both sequences, either word token sequences or just character sequences or byte sequences. So these deep learning models are quite extremely um, uh, uh, powerful that they are able to learn language from the byte UTF encoding all the way to semantic meaning. Now, a caveat, by converting a sequence from two words and tokens to byte, you make it between four to eight x longer. And that has computational penalty, which we will discuss later uh, so, uh, then in the next section. So one, 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 quick, one quick comment is that every time I give talks about transformer, as people in academia um, will be saying, OK, but all of these, you know, the end-to-end -end learning you have been proposing is fantastic. and uh, great, but it's really computationally expensive, and it's uh, uh, um, unrealistic, you know, uh, to assume that we have no intervention at each step of the NLP pipeline and just give up everything to a deep learning network. And I want to highlight the word of, you know, uh, the, uh, the aspect of uh, costs. It's true that things used to be more expensive uh, than today, but the, the positive side, things are getting really way cheaper than ever. And thanks to accelerated hardware and new generation of GPUs and TPUs, but also into advancement of optimizers that allow us to train on large batches um, in each step, like LAM optimizer, reducing memory with other factor, and so on. And I just want to give uh, anecdotal evidence that is not necessarily going to be the most best numbers or best prices, and not necessarily, you know, uh, most probably within six months we'll get even better results. But just in August this year, MLPERF is an industrial well-recognized benchmark, re uh, released their training results over several models in vision, audio, and text. And to train BERT, um, a 100 million parameters model, uh, some of Google entries, if you are using TPU, you end up training it in 56 minutes. If you use eight GPUs, you end up with 200 minutes. And I personally just looked at the public pricing Google gives on TPU and GPU, and it's quite clear to me, like you can get like state-of-the-art results with basically $24 per hour, okay? And I believe this is orders of magnitude gonna drop in the couple of next years. So there's a lot of advancement in writing more efficient, you know, um, code for training, more efficient hardware, and better, you know, architectures and better optimizers. Uh, so this is by no means only uh, limited to people with uh, big budgets. It, it, it's quite clear to me there is a huge industrial effort to make this is more of a streamlined process that almost with one click you can pre-train in a huge corpus, you know, uh, state-of-art models. Okay, so now we are moving to the last section, which is the challenges of 
uh, we are facing in scaling, you know, the transformer and self-attention uh, network. Uh, should we wait for take more questions or wait for them? Maybe we can take one question um, cool. uh, for now, and then yeah, I'll get back to the sure. others. Let me see. So, um, is there the question is that is there still a place for RNNs? Do they maintain any sort of results? Um, so, so the problem with RNN basically is they go against the grain. What I mean by that is that the RNN is a sequential process. All of the hardware we have is extremely parallelized. Like most of the hardware that we have is a matrix multiplication, and it only can scale up if you reduce the amount of dependencies you have. So even if I and you and everyone agrees that language fundamentally a sequential problem, and you know the order, the sequential order matters a lot, uh, because it the hardware is not sequential and does not perform optimally sequentially you're always going to get better results uh, on with architecture that are more easy to parallelize because you are able to train bigger models and you are able to train faster and iterate more over the hyperparameters so you know it's hard theoretically to argue against you know rnns but i would say the anecdotal the the, the practical benefits of having a parallel architecture like the attention where you are processing all time steps all the time at, at the same moment and not waiting for one to process to get to start the second one will always be superior because the hardware is just preferring that in terms of processing. So I, I think like there is synergy between the architecture and the hardware and that therefore you can see the transformers are, you know, are blasting through all of the, uh, all of the leaderboard in terms of equality, equality metrics, uh, just because I think like it, it they are just allow you to train more data, bigger model, way faster than whatever and w any RNN you can do. So um, I guess like if you are willing to spend more computation, more latency, more data, you can get RNN to outperform transformers. But I, I think, um, you know, uh, the hardware will always prefer uh, more parallel units, more parallel computation and every model that has sequential, de more dependencies in terms of execution will be at disadvantage. Uh, in terms of answering, you know, like directly the question, I am not aware of where if RNN holds any. Uh, I think I, I think all of the current results are transformers, but you know, this is my my knowledge is limited to the applications I care about. So it might be there are still a couple of benchmark where still people are using RNN, but to to my understanding is everything is switched to transformers. Okay, Rami, I think uh, we can take um, more questions at the end. I'll let you finish cool. through your Yeah, so the last section will be the, the brief one because it's still in development kind of uh, area where, you know, there are papers every day, including yesterday. One of the slides actually include results from yesterday. So, um, and also my understanding of all of these new development is, um, I would say less than perfect because each one of them need a talk on its own. Uh, to explain the differences, but the general idea is that you know, people arguing that you know attention is expensive because the attention you are building a complete graph over all of the states of the sequence. This is n square, um, and basically that is going to be quadratic computation. The longer the sequence you have, the more computation you need. However, you know you get a benefit where the maximum path of information exchange is one. Any time step can look at any other time step, regardless of how much they are far away from each other. Something that extremely limits the RNN domain is that if I want to exchange information between the first token in the sequence with the last one, I have to wait for theta n number of operation to pass this information. Of course, at the benefit of reducing the computation. So now it's not dependent on the sequence length, but dependent to the hidden dimension. So you are exchanging, you know, which one is bigger? Is your hidden dimension big or your sequence is big and convolution kind of give like middle ground between both okay so uh open ai they studied extensively what does it take to improve the performance of transformer networks in paper called scaling laws of neural neural language models and they found this simple kind of equation to hold very well basically if the length of the sequence you are looking at is less than 12 times the hidden dimension of your model the computation is pretty much decided by the total number of parameters and not dependent on the sequence length. 
However, if it's if the sequence length is more, yes, you will have a quadratic dependency. It's not showing quadratic because the computation is per token. So it's quadratic. This is per token. So for all tokens will be quadratic. OK, so what that means for NLP application, usually our hidden layer is like a thousand dimensions. OK, so for us to see uh, a quite extreme penalty, quadratic penalty by doing self attention, my sequence has to be more than 12,000 tokens. OK, now what does that mean? You know, I went to Google and said it's 12,000 world. What does that mean? Well, it says if it's single spaced page, it will be 24 pages. OK, so. I, there's not many uh, problems in NLP where you need to process 24 pages to do an answer. So I would say, to a large degree, we are more concerned, like the, most of our computational uh, um, complexity comes from the hidden dimension and less actually from the um, uh, sequence length. Now, that by no means mean, you know, should uh, discourage us from investigating better ways of doing you know, uh, speeding up the self-attention. So one idea I keep asking people is that in your sequence, are all the subsequences ambiguous? Like, is ice cream ambiguous? Because if it's not ambiguous, one thing you can do, you can segment the sequence into chunks where for every chunk you don't have to do self-attention. You can just learn an embedding, okay? And now your sequence is way shorter. One common, one common example is that you can look at DNA as a sequence of base pairs, and that's totally fine. But you might imagine that you know the base pairs that encode an amino acid are context-free, in the sense you really don't have to look at dependencies beyond the three letters. Therefore, you might segment first the DNA into amino acid, and now your sequence is three times shorter. So one argument is that if you have a problem where sequences are long, one way is to shrink down the sequence by learning segmentation that is, you know, uh, uh, generate context-free, you know, subsequences. One another way is applied by BERT. If you have a wide distribution of sequences, some of them short, some of them are long, and you want to save the training time, you first try to train on short sequences, you know, and later on in the training, you start to increase the maximum length of the sequences you train on, in the hope that you, in the beginning, you learn, you know, uh, how to treat uh, short sequences, and that understanding of short sequences will help you with the long one. And in inference time, your hope is that most of your sequences are short, so uh, and only small portion are long, so you're already ready to deal with long, but you because you trained on them at the end of the training. But you know uh, you can ha you know you save a lot of time by just focusing on the short ones. So Bert pre-trained a sequence of 128 steps, and at the last 10 percent of the training, they moved to 512, just to make sure that the positional embedding can understand to understand to up to 512, and they can deal with it if it if it shows up in in serving time. One other idea I applied in Smart Reply for YouTube creators is basically reduce the sequence length uh, incrementally, but not by segmentation and not by you know pre-processing, um, just by dropping the sequence. So the first transformer layer lo look at all the time steps in the sequence, generate encodings, then at the next application of the transformer layer, basically I ignore half every other step. Okay, so I start with eight, end up with four, the next one will end up with two. And finally, I will end up with one single vector representation. Okay. Now, this does not work necessarily well for applications where you have seek-to-seek -seek generation. I was interested in retrieval application, so I was happy to have one vector representation. But the big idea is that, you know, with minimal loss of equality, not all of these time steps after the first two layers are really necessarily to carry over. For the rest of the application, for the rest of the processing, actually, some of these encoder are quite encoding quite similar uh, in representation. So dropping some of them is actually does not you don't lose too much information. Now the way I applied it was predefined and predetermined what I need to drop, and I think it's a quite an interesting future work research area to decide which steps in the transformer to drop at each layer. Okay, so you learn what to ignore instead of me just deciding it ahead of time. Other ideas, you know, um, efficient uh, attention came up with instead of thinking about the pairwise similarity between n to n between all items in a uh, sequence, we can think of it as you know, um, basically matrix multiplication associative. Rearrange the matrix multiplication such that you have 
you multiply the uh, the query uh, the value by the key and then multiply it by the query this will end up with a d by d matrix instead of n by n now again the same equation happens is that which one is bigger is the hidden dimension bigger than the sequence length or not in nlp application it's mostly the case that the sequence length is way shorter than the hidden dimension therefore we like this formulation of matrix multiplication if you have a problem where the sequence is way bigger than the hidden dimension you might like to rearrange the you multiply the key by the value instead of multiplying the query by the key another interesting idea and i think uh not not easy to achieve it's called compressing the memory so you could imagine that your model is processing sequences at two different speeds one normal speed where every time you are seeing one token at a time but one get updated less frequently because it has to process all of this memory and compress it in one time step. So here you have the time step that is four to one. Every four time steps in this section has to be compressed to one here, okay? Uh, other ideas try to combine local attention with the global attention. So here is you have a global attention in a causal language modeling, then you add to it some global exchanges of information uh, in different paradigms. Um, the same thing could be applied for document understanding. Here is a full attention. Here is a local attention. You can combine local attention with dilated and sliding windows with some global attention. The problem with these models is that the implementation might not lead to speed up just because the hardware is just more optimal for one matrix multiplication. So this is more aligned with the hardware than all of these techniques. So just keep that in mind while theoretically these should be in principle faster not all of the without careful implementation and well tuning um and clever tricks of how to write the code you might not achieve the speed up you're looking for okay other ideas is trying to figure out segmentation on the fly and only attend within each segment okay uh, called reformer with extra details on how doing reversible layers and so on and uh, it's an interesting and fantastic paper. It, it needs a token its own, so I'm not going to delve into details. Um, I'm going to leave you with this big picture when it comes to the um, uh, paradigm of how to speed up, you know, uh, uh, transformer networks. Um, there are so many techniques. I think there are 13 papers here. This survey paper just came yesterday, uh, Efficient Transformers. I encourage you to look at it. But this is an aggressive and um, uh, hot research area. Um, uh, and I just want to remind everyone that some fields like might not be in big urgency to speed up their transformer because the, the most of the computation is not influenced by the, the quadratic term, but, but rather by the linear term. And they might benefit more from techniques to shrink the sequence length than techniques to speed up the attention. And that's it. That's it for today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rami. Actually, amazingly on time. Um, uh, this was a great tour de force of uh, yeah, attention and language from scratch. So this is great. Um, we have a few questions, and please type more questions if you if you have other urgent questions. Please uh, type them as we're going through some of them. Um, I think I'll start with one here that says, uh, "Can you successfully use a network pre-trained on a language corpus?" to translate an entirely different type of sequential information. Uh, for example, a series of electronic sync signals or with variable time spacing or, um, yeah. Uh, uh, talk about the transfer of uh, these representations that are learned. So, so, so uh, currently we are looking at a little bit less ambitious goal of if we train uh, transformers on five pairs of languages for translation, can we learn to translate um, a new language we never see. Like you, tra you train the translation English to, fr to French, can you learn with a small number of examples to, tra to translate to Mongolian to English? Um, and we are finding that to be, you know, moderate success. So in a sense, it, um, think about the new domain as a new language. If you never saw the script, like it's not only using Latin, if it's using Latin script, you might share representations but if you're never even seeing the the, the, the same script you will struggle um, so I imagine the domain you are talking about the question is like does it have similar structure to language does it have long-term dependencies in the same way uh, but more interestingly is there a, a clever way to serialize your problem such that it utilizes language like could you have described 
the electrical signal traces in a language natural way, you might benefit. Um, I know people who use GPT-3 uh, with the three, four examples, giving the description of what a web page lo should look like and producing CSS. And they found that GPT-3 could actually, you know, produce CSS, at least that can run without syntax errors. Uh, and the same thing for JavaScript. So people are looking at designing a whole web page just from a natural description. So I would say it, it really depends on how much clever the serialization. I think if you pre-train on language, it's important to serialize in your problem in a way that looks like lang language, even if it's not necessarily language. But um, um, but again, the, the more the serialization far away, the, we don't expect it to work really better than just a training in the same on domain. Um, uh, this is a detailed question. How do you implement bidirectionality in transformer models? Do you need to uh, left to right and a right to left positional embedding? Uh, absolutely not. The, the, the self-attention mechanism is uh, many to many. There is no specific direction whatsoever in the attention. Uh, we only inject the order by modifying the input. So you could think about the attention, if I have a sequence of 10 words, it's literally a graph, a complete graph, with every word having an edge with every other word. It's not a, you think about, you know, what RNN is trying to encode, a, a linear chain. We don't have a, that structure anymore. Every word can see every other word. So it's not only bidirectional, it's all directions, in a sense. And that's by default. Um. Question here says, have the patterns and statistics of attention been studied in more detail? For example, can one learn something about the language uh, data by looking at the attention patterns? Uh, a fantastic question. Absolutely. I actually was uh, almost adding that slide where people, uh, there is, uh, BERT is a quite famous transformer network on top of language, and there is subfield of NLP interested in, un you know, understanding what the transformer learn and what BERT learned. They call it BERTology even. Uh, what they discovered that you think about the self-attention as almost like um, parser trees or syntax trees. So the attention mechanism really follow syntactic rules and constraints versus the encodings of the time steps are more semantic. So think about it that the graph nodes are semantic meaning, and the way they are connected to each other is kind of ruled by the grammar. So that's kind of one, you know, generalization of one of the papers, and I found it uh, extremely interesting that compared to 10 years uh, earlier in NLP, where people have to learn syntax alone using parsing models and semantics alone and struggle to combine them, we have a model that learns both the structure and the meaning together. So yeah, people actually study the attention masks. They use the attention mask even as features for syntactic problems and so on, and they found success with that. Um, another question, has it, has it become more important to get sophisticated prompts uh, for fine tuning rather than training for BERT and GPT-3 type models? You are saying, is it, imp is it important to find the right prompt? Uh, is that the question? I, I think so. It's asking like, is it? Are we at the stage where we would rather like? Uh, oh, I, I see. Uh, you know, tailor mm -hmm. more sophisticated prompts rather than trying to retrain BERT or GPT three from scratch. I think that's the question. Well, I, I would say we should do both, but um, uh, there was a paper where people actually found, proved that changing the choice of words of how you describe the task will lead to different performance. Uh, so, for example, for T5, if you say, is this sentence false or true? If you serialize your problem such that the output, the word is uh, correct, incorrect, versus true and false, they found the choice of how to even label uh, classification tasks, what are the label names, it will change because the model have a tendency to know that it already saw evidence on the web that if something if something is truly correct, it's, it should be called a true and so on. So if you name them, for example, X, Y, Z, A, B, C, the model will learn from these labels, but will not utilize the pre-trained representation. So the choice of is important of how to describe the task and how to serialize the output, especially in classification. Um, now, should we stop doing pre-training more models? I, I don't think so. I think we should do both. Um, also, you know, while GPT-3 kind of paradigm is a quiet, a lot of creativity, it's kind of like unprincipled. So. Um, I find the fine tuning is, is way more um, 
controllable paradigm of thinking because you give it examples and you update the parameters of the model. Now, there are reasons to think that I don't want to update the model because it's too big and I don't want to fork it hundreds of times for hundreds of tasks. But I guess this is still a research area. What is the optimal adaptation strategy for big, big, huge, you know, hundreds of billions of parameters models? How, what is the best adaptation strategy such that I use the same model for multiple tasks? Do I do the open AI paradigm of changing the prompt and description of the task or I update the parameter of the model and if I update the parameter of the model, should I update everything in the model or should I add one layer on top of it and so on? So people are looking in different, uh, but the research is going in all directions, improving the pre-training and improving the, the adaptation uh, uh, methods. Um, another question somewhat on the detail, it's uh, asking what is the importance of auxiliary losses on intermediate transformer layers of attention? Do you have an intuition for when and why they work? Uh, so, so we use this in, in our the first paper of character language modeling we, we implemented. And I think it's an artifact of um, uh, it's necessary if you are using something like SGD. So we notice in our second paper follow up that when we st for character language modeling, when we switch from um, mod, uh, SGD to Adam, we don't need auxiliary tasks. But if Adam is too expensive in terms of memory and you don't, you want to build a big model and you don't want to uh, take 2x the amount of memory just for Adam parameters. And so you are forced to use SGD. Uh, auxiliary tasks tend to improve SGD uh, convergence rate significantly. So we did not understood that at the time of the first paper, but by the second paper, we understood that the auxiliary allowed us to do uh, a great convergence with big models with SGD alone. So. Um, a question about, I think this question was early in the lecture when uh, you were talking about embeddings. Mm -hmm. uh, it says, what about if the vocabulary of the sequence is variable? Does it need to be um, retrained from scratch for attention modeling? Um, if, so the models that only deal with, um, uh, the mo only models that ad deal with, um, uh, with fixed size are the DNNs. For transfer for for RN, seek to seek with attention definitely RNN can deal with variability of sequence. Uh, for I think it's asking about the variability of the of the dictionary the vocabulary. Oh, the dictionary. Okay, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's hard to add new items uh, because you need parameters for these items. So if you train with a vocabulary ten thousand items, you might use them to feed. A bigger vocabulary, but the extra 10,000 you added extra items in the new vocabulary has to be trained. So, um, uh, yeah, changing the vocabulary most of the time forces you to pre-train again. Uh, I think there was many questions, and now we're um, six or seven minutes um, uh, over time. So I think uh, maybe this is a good point to stop. Rami, thank you again for this great lecture and for joining us today and for the, the fantastic slides. I think I need to go back to actually so many of them. Um, cool. And thanks everyone thank for attending. Next uh, week, we'll have uh, uh, Maziar talking about uh, uh, how to incorporate machine learning in um, uh, uh, PDE solvers. Um, and that's a topic that is relevant to so many uh, computational sciences. So please join us next week. Thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much for inviting me. Yeah, thank you, Rami. Bye. Thank you.